This was back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time this happened. My family and I had just moved across states. We'd just gotten to the city where we planned on living after quite a long road trip. We were all extremely hungry, so we decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us because we hadn't moved into our house quite yet, we decided to eat out in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family though, so I finished well before any of them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business real quick. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground together. I grew up in Florida, you see, so I wasn't used to seeing these large piles of autumn leaves. There I was, just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings, when all of a sudden I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned back to see a man. My dog noticed him immediately and tried to jump on him as she does with anyone. I pulled her back while I backed away from this random guy. As I observed him closer, he appeared to be in his mid-40s or 50s. He smiled creepily at me. A very forced smile. He said in this scruffy southern voice, You have my dog, my border collie. Immediately, a red flag went off in my mind. My dog very obviously looks nothing like a border collie. Now, let me tell you, I'm horrible at confrontation. So instead of confronting him directly, I just nervously said, I think you're mistaken, sir. This is my dog. I didn't even think to tell him how my dog didn't look anything like what he was describing. I looked over quickly to my parents' car that was just a couple of feet ahead of me, unsure of what to do in this situation. It seemed they hadn't even noticed the man approaching me, as they were all on their phones. The man then asked me this. Well, if that's not my dog, would you be able to come help me look for it? I could feel my stomach drop in that moment. I didn't want to make a scene. I wasn't sure if I was overreacting or not, but I'd read my fair share of kidnapping and sex trafficking horror stories, so I did have a vague idea in the back of my mind about what was going down. He then said something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you if you'll help me. My hands were sweating at this point. This was something straight out of a Reddit thread or a movie or something. He pointed over to a very sketchy, run-down looking truck. I told him I was too busy and I had to leave right now. Best of luck finding his dog though. I was still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now though, I don't know why I didn't just tell him my parents were right there. If I did, maybe he would have backed off. I guess I was overly worried about what might happen. I was trying to be polite so we wouldn't get mad and escalate things further. All of a sudden he grabbed my dog's leash out of my hand and said he had treats at his truck. He then started to walk away with my dog. I grabbed the leash back and tried to pull it away from him sternly saying, I have to go right now. As I tried to walk away, he grabbed my wrist and fully ripped the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He began to pull me along with him, mumbling something like, just come and see what I have for you. My dog, the good sweet girl she was, followed after us and started barking fiercely. He was dragging me pretty firmly along with him. I'm pretty small at 5 foot 4, and I don't have much upper body strength. All I could do was start screaming for him to let go of me. My parents, alarmed after hearing me scream and seeing our dog chasing after me barking, saw the man pulling me against my will. Immediately, they started sprinting after me. I started screaming even louder. I think he was alarmed when he heard me yell out to my mom, as he could see her now running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in the car the whole time must have really shocked him. He let me go and tried to make a run for it. We didn't decide to chase after him. My parents were just glad to still have me. This was definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina. Not even lived there a day yet. I don't wish this sort of thing to ever happen to anyone, as it was extremely terrifying. My advice for you, though, is don't be afraid to use your words, even if they might anger the person.
I went to college in a historic mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time lived in a duplex downtown, maybe about three blocks from campus or so. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large historic homes near me. It took place about three years ago. A little backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked, and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door as well. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night only one of my roommates was home. We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but really only spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main front door locked at all times. They always made sure to do a really good job of doing so. So, me and my roommate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked and smoking a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door and quickly realize the girls upstairs must have ordered a pizza. Later on, we came to find that they'd forgotten to lock the front door again after receiving that pizza. So, we finally go to sleep in our own rooms. Since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop right next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I'd initially fallen asleep, I was suddenly woken up by something I didn't recognize at first. As I came to of it, I came to realize there was a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I was not dreaming, I noticed he was quickly moving my phone and computer off of my bed and moving my comforter as well, trying to climb in. I started asking the man who he was, what he's doing here. I was extremely confused and still groggy. I was also still slightly high from before I'd gone to sleep. The only thing he said to me, multiple times, was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point, I began to panic, as my mind obviously went right to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random Tinder guy over and he'd simply gone to the wrong room. But the more I tried to question him, all he had to say was that he was going to get into bed with me. I did own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I had left them on a shelf that the man was right in front of, so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get the fuck out right now, I will scream. They'll be here in seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare the man off. I don't know if he brought something with him or if he stole something from me, but I did see him grab at something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left, I shut the door and locked it and tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere. Then I quickly realized that between my room and the front door was the room of my friend that was still home. As scared as I was in that moment, I was even more terrified that maybe the man had gone into her room. I grabbed my stun gun and my knife, counted to three, and ripped open the door. I burst into my roommate's room, only to find her fast asleep. There was no evidence of the man still being around. I quickly woke her up and told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I even began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw our front door wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone and finally found it, hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I'd left it earlier. That sent a chill up my spine, as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and room while I was sleeping, at least long enough to take and hide my phone. That only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at this point believed me. We barricaded ourselves in and called 911. Within minutes, there were cars swarming our street and yard, and they yelled for us to quickly leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen officers came rushing in and searched every inch of our apartment. We woke up the girls upstairs and searched their apartment as well to ensure the man had well and truly left. The officers had me write a statement, and I gave them a description of the man. To this day, I've never heard a single thing about the case. I just feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation. The thought of his intentions terrifies me though, and additionally, the fact he was never caught scares me. I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear I did. I will add there was a chance he might have been on drugs or mentally ill, 
and perhaps had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I'll never be able to know. With the fact that he tried to hide my phone, I can only assume the worst. So I'm a bartender at a gentleman's club. Our uniform, if you can call it that, is a very short, skimpy black dress and black bra. Due to my uniform being the way it is, I do my best to not have to go out in public directly after work. This is due to dirty looks and perverted comments that I really don't have the time or patience for. Back before the current state of the world, I had just gotten off work. It was around 2.30 a.m., I believe, and I decided to run to my local Walmart to grab some dog food and other household items. I was thinking there probably wouldn't be anyone there besides staff so late at night. I ran in with a jacket on as well, to try and be at least a little bit modest. I went directly to the pet aisles. I could see there was a guy stalking the shelves. I gave a small wave and smiled, and proceeded to looking for my dog's brand of food. I grabbed a 20-pound bag, and the man asked if I needed some help. I'm not really a small girl, but I do have a slight frame. I'm tall, but very skinny, if that makes sense. I told him I was fine, thanked him, and headed to the grocery section. I was in the freezer area when my stalker slash stalker showed up again, this time with another guy. They were just standing there, watching me decide which pizza to pick. When I turned to leave, the man once again asked if I needed any help. I told him no, thanked again, and smiled. I then made my way to the checkout aisle. On my way out, I saw a man heading out about 10 feet behind me. I quickly walked to my car, threw my purchases in the passenger side, jumped in and locked my doors immediately. I was worried this person would try to follow me. All I wanted to do was go home. I felt dumb after realizing the man was going to his own car, and it was situated nowhere near me. Breathing a sigh of relief, I started my 15-minute drive home. I was about halfway there when I noticed that black car behind me, taking all the same turns as I was. I live in a very rural area. It's possible he lived nearby, but there weren't many people who ever took these roads, especially not this late at night. I turned a road after mine, and he made the exact same turn. This led to a dead-end road, with only a cow farm at the very end, so I knew now he was definitely following me. I called my boyfriend and told him what was going on. I didn't want to drive home where he would know where I lived, and asked my boyfriend to meet me at Walmart instead. I sped the whole way there, hoping a cop was sitting somewhere and would pull me over. The black car was right on my ass. I pulled into the Walmart parking lot and parked directly under a street lamp. The black car pulled into the spot directly across from mine. Now I was freaking out. Fifteen seconds later, I saw my boyfriend's truck rushing into the lot. He pulled up right next to me, asked if I was okay, and I pointed out the car to him. My boyfriend was not a small man. He was about six foot four, and very muscular as well. His arms alone were about the size of my head. He was a very intimidating person if you don't know him, but really he's a very quiet and kind man. He hopped out of his truck and started to walk over to that car, yelling at them. You need to talk to her about something, or you need to talk to me. The guy in the black car immediately rushed off. I don't know if it was the same man who was hanging out with the stalker or what, but that's why I don't go out after work anymore. I was in college at the time this happened. My roommate was a born-again Christian, and she invited me to her Bible study and church all the time. Eventually, I did go with her, and kept going as well. I wasn't a big fan of the pastor, but there were a lot of nice young adults who liked to have clean, sober fun. I didn't drink or party at all, so I felt like I fit right in. I didn't necessarily agree with everything they believed in, though. Just the more normal stuff, like God, helping the poor, not some of the more extreme things. This one guy in the Bible study, Drew, was pretty quiet. He was good-looking as well. 
may seem like he knew everything about the Bible, which really amazed me. At the time, I thought, wow, he knows so much more than me. He's so wise. I was only 21 and he was 27. He wasn't a college student or anything, he just worked, which I later learned maybe he didn't even do that. We were going to go on a young adult's retreat, and because I worked, I couldn't leave early on Friday to drive up to the mountains with the girls in the group. Mutual friends said I could ride with Drew instead, so I said okay. On the way up, Drew was pretty quiet for the first hour, not very friendly at all, and it was a long trip as well. As we started to get closer to the location, he began to warm up a bit though. We grabbed some pizza, and he paid, which was nice. Then he stopped the car just so we could look at the stars, even played some Brian McKnight. He was quickly turning it into a date, but I didn't know or see it that way back then. I was starting to like him, and feel like we had a connection though. He was just about to drop me off at the girl's cabin, when he suddenly got very serious and told me that something had happened between him and another girl in our church group. He told me she was simply telling lies about him and not to believe whatever I heard. He didn't explain what actually happened, mind you, and didn't say who this was either. I entered the cabin and all the girls were there. Very quickly, one girl, Bree, who was the youngest in the entire group at 19, told all of us this. Ladies, there is a wolf in sheep's clothing among us at this retreat. Now, if you don't know church folk, they get very dramatic and tend to talk like this all the time. So, in my mind, I just thought, okay, here's some juicy drama coming up. She told us this story about how she was talking to some guy here, but he started stalking her and wouldn't take no for an answer, even threatened to hurt her sister. Now, my spidey senses were tingling. I realized that this must be what Drew was telling me about. The church group didn't know who it was because she refused to say. She said she didn't want to stir gossip, and the leadership would handle it on their own. Drew eventually left the weekend retreat early. There goes my ride back, I thought. I didn't know if he was asked to leave or what. Later that week, though, Drew asked me to hang out, and I agreed. I still liked him, and I didn't know who to believe at this point. On our hangout, we didn't really do anything. He took me to the mall and read the Bible to me. Okay, that was a little bit weird. He then parked his car on some suburban lookout and just said he was a view guy who really liked views. I was not one to be impressed by suburban lights. Overall, it was just very boring. I decided to give him another chance, though. I invited him to come see a play with me. When he came, he immediately met one of my good friends, Brian. Brian introduced us to his boyfriend, Nick. I'm in theater, so I have many gay friends. For the majority of the rest of the date, though, Drew lectured me about how all gays are going to hell, and I must not really love them if I didn't stop to tell them that. I began to cry because of this ugly argument in his car. He argued with me for hours in the lot. I just wanted to go home. It turned into the worst date ever. Obviously, I didn't agree with what he said. He then told me I needed to give up on my dream of being an actress, because what if the Lord didn't want me to do that? Theater is something I'd been doing my whole life, not to mention my major as well. His reasons for me giving it up had nothing to do with the impracticality of it, but simply because God said so. I began to see that this guy was nuts. I got home, and I offered to make us some cocoa to just kind of end things as friends, or at least on a better note. I knew I would see him at church in the future, and we had mutual friends as well. Things were going to get weird if it ended badly. He tried to get sexual with me, and then blamed me for tempting him. I ended up crying even more. I just wanted him to go home, but I was so emotionally exhausted, I didn't really know what to do. He eventually left, he called me and texted me that week, but I refused to respond. Sunday night rolled around once more. I was talking to my friend Tim, who no longer went to that church anymore. I told him I'd gone on a date with Drew, and before I could even tell him how it went, Tim said, What? That guy is crazy. You need to abort that mission right now. Turns out he was close with Bree and her family. Drew really was a stalker, and had really threatened to hurt Bree's sister. I didn't know what to do. I hung up and called my mom and tried to tell her what happened, what Tim told me about Drew. How it was such weird timing considering what happened to me. 
while I was on the phone with my mom, I got a sudden knock at the door. It was 11 p.m. on a Sunday night. I looked out to see who it was, only to find no one was out there. I went to get my roommate and ask her if she could sit with me in the front room. I was freaked out now. There was another knock at the door. I peeked and it was Drew, looking all in a frenzy. I asked him what he was doing there. He said he needed to talk to me. I wasn't answering my phone, so this was the only way. The conversation was getting a bit long in the tooth. My roommate was sitting there in anticipation. I told her she could go back to her room and that it was okay. I let him come in like a dumbass because I'd been conditioned to be overly nice. This was a big mistake. We started talking, but as soon as my roommate left, he pulled out a knife. He started saying how he was worried my neighbors had done something to me because I wasn't answering his texts. That he didn't know what kind of situation he'd be walking into. I have zero fighting skills and no experience in this situation at all. All I could do was to ask him as calmly as possible, Hey, can you put the knife away maybe? He asked me if I wanted the knife. I said no. I somehow talked him down and got him to leave. The next morning, my mind was a lot clearer. I felt like I needed to tell my mom what happened. She had me tell my dad as well, who had me tell the church youth leader and security at my apartment. I told the cop the whole story too, said the guy was definitely a stalker, and I would see him again unless the police visited him. I said it was fine. I thought everything would be okay. I just didn't want any more drama. I had never talked to a cop about anything before. I didn't understand how serious it was, I think. My mistake. The next night I went to a party. Another church-related one. Drew was not supposed to be there. He'd even told me beforehand he wasn't going. Well, there he was. I decided to leave in that moment, but my 21-year-old self didn't think to ask someone to walk me out. I figured if I left and he was still there, problem solved. I didn't anticipate him following me. I was walking to my car in the dark apartment parking lot when I heard him call out my name. He was following me. I started to run, and he began to chase me. I was clicking my car to open, thinking to myself, this is how the white girl dies in the horror movies, because she didn't let the cop visit the stalker because she's dumb. Thankfully, though, my car unlocked. I hopped in and drove away. Problem is, Drew already knew where I lived. I had to move out two weeks later and blocked him on all social media. Eventually, he managed to make another Facebook profile and sent me a message that summer saying he was praying for me and had forgiven me for trashing him to people, even though I never told anyone what happened. That was the last I saw and heard of him. Unfortunately, this predator continued to serve at that church in the junior high ministry of all places, around many young girls. No one on the church leadership listened to me, or to Bree. I never reached out to her to let her know what happened to me, and I never got to hear her full story in detail. I did tell the young adult pastor about the knife and him trying to get sexual with me, and how I was scared. Thankfully, I don't go to that church anymore. This was all pre-Me Too movement. What sucks the most is, I've had quite a few experiences with crazy religious dudes just like him. This was the first, but definitely not the last. I'm still trying to come to terms with why exactly that is. I, 22 and female, used to do DoorDash on the side for some extra cash. This was in the summer of 2018, when it was a little bit newer. At least, in my town it was. Since then, I think they've made a lot of changes, but at the time this happened, it was very unorganized. If you somehow don't know what DoorDash is, it's a food delivery type service, typically for restaurants that don't usually deliver. Think things like McDonald's and such. Anyway, one night I was doing deliveries pretty much all day, so I decided to finish up my last delivery at around 10pm or so. I get an order in, and the person wants a medium cheese and pepperoni pizza, and some loaded potato wedges from this pizzeria nearby. I was kind of wondering to myself why they'd order from a pizzeria that delivers anyway, but I figured it was because it was notorious for taking forever when you order for delivery. I accepted the order and had it on over. 
I got there, picked up the pizza, and confirmed on the app that I'd picked everything up and was on my way. The app notified me of some special instructions the customer had asked for, which was to call them when I arrived outside. Okay, that's not too unusual. Lots of people ask for that so they can come out to meet me. I roll up to the address and find it's downtown. It's a larger apartment-type building. It was completely pitch black as well. Instantly upon approaching, I got an eerie feeling. I pulled up to the curb but stayed in the car. There was no way I was about to go near that building by myself. I called up the number. Luckily, DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number when you call for it. It rung a couple of times, and then this really creepy woman's voice came over the line. Sorry, we can't get to the phone right now. We're a little bit tied up. Then they started to creepily giggle. The entire time in the background, I could make out what seemed to be another woman screaming. As I focused a bit more, I could hear this person was screaming for help and begging for their life. It got even louder, as if the creepy woman was purposely putting the screaming woman on the phone or something. Instantly, I hung up and drove off, real quick, not even knowing which direction to go in. Luckily, there was a super popular restaurant just a couple of blocks away. I pulled into that parking lot and pulled up the app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order. I contacted the help center, and they told me to wait 15 minutes to see if they'd call or message me about their food. Well, they never did call, so thank God for that at least. I was sitting there in the parking lot of the restaurant, telling my mom about this. We agreed that it was probably a prank, but just in case it wasn't, I decided to call the police anyway. I dialed the non-emergency number and told them everything. The police told me they were going to do a wellness check and thanked me for calling them to tell them about it. I went home, but nothing ever came of it. I still think about it from time to time, though. I did get a free pizza and some potato wedges, so that was cool at least. But I really hope that was just a prank or something. I hope the lady screaming in that apartment was safe and okay in the end. This happened last Friday night. I finally arrived home now, and I really need to get this off my chest. My friend's family owns a pretty big house in a rural area in my state, where they spend most holidays and some vacations. They also own an apartment a few blocks away from where I live downtown. His folks usually go there about once a month to check the maintenance and see if there's any mail. Since we're having a pandemic, though, they're not going out to do so as much anymore. My friend rang me up and asked if I could join with him. He said he'd need an extra pair of hands. It was about a four and a half hour drive or so. He came here to pick me up and we left around 3 p.m. due to his work. We arrived and parked the car and we went to check the house. It was already too dark to check the surroundings. The house itself seemed fine. We had a couple of beers, watched some old DVDs, and made a frozen pizza we'd taken with us before we went to bed. Sometime during the night, though, we heard a loud noise coming from the front door. We were both awoken by this noise and went over to check. It was firmly closed just as we'd left it. We decided to further check the house, though, and see if something was up. I must add that this house has a door connecting the kitchen to the garage, which has only two lamps near that door. Just as we were about to enter, my friend suddenly stopped me, his eyes shooting wide open. Before I could even verbally confirm what was wrong, I heard the sound of someone breathing loudly. I looked over to the car and was stunned with surprise when I locked eyes with somebody hiding behind it. Immediately, we ran back inside and locked the garage door tight. I went to call the cops, and he snatched up a knife. The cops came, searched the garage, and found a backpack with a hatchet and duct tape. They said it was probably someone who knew the friend's parents' routine, maybe worked for them in the past or something. Clearly, they were getting ready to attack them. The door had not been forced open, and that indicated that this person had been there before and knew exactly how to get in. They'd escaped by breaking a window in the garage. 
We gave our statements, of course, and stayed up all night after. We called his parents in the morning. We even had to stay there while the window and locks were being replaced. Needless to say, we could not get out of there fast enough. I'm a waitress at a local Italian restaurant that also does deliveries and pickups. One day, I would say maybe a year ago or so, a man came in to place a carry-out order. A girl I work with noticed him walking up to the door and asked me if I would take care of him. I said yes, not really thinking anything of it, and she walked back into the kitchen. Once he came in, I could see immediately why she'd asked me to do with him instead. He immediately gave me the creeps. He was an older man, short and stout, wearing a big coat and a winter hat. He absolutely reeked like someone who smoked an entire pack of cigarettes while walking through piles of cow dung. Even thinking of it now, in my apartment all alone, I can still smell that smell. What really scared me, though, was the way he stared into my face, chin turned down towards his chest, looking up at me through his eyebrows. His stare made me feel like he was thinking of every possible way to torture me or something. He didn't say much, just sort of growled his order at me. He paid and waited behind the counter for his pizza to take home. He would pace with his hands locked behind his back, never shaking that stare. Even when he would turn to pace the other way, he never tore his glance away from me, not even for a single second. He didn't even blink. Being that I was working behind the counter, I couldn't really go anywhere in case someone called or came in to get their order. So I had to just stand there, watching the clock tick, waiting for his order to be done so he could finally leave. Once he was gone, I asked my coworker if she knew anything else about him and why she'd wanted me to take care of him so badly. She told me he really gave her the creeps. He was apparently a registered sex offender but never went into the full details of his charges. Honestly, I didn't want to know either. I still thought about him for the rest of the day, and even looked twice before getting into my car at the end of the night. Soon enough, though, I forgot all about him. Unfortunately, that would not be the last time I saw him. He began to come in very frequently after. At first, maybe only once every other week. Then, every single week. Then, every day. Every time, he would order the exact same thing and begin his pacing with his unblinking, burning stare. Every chance I could, I would run into the kitchen or get away from the counter with any excuse I could find. My co-workers all began to make jokes about how much he liked me, saying he'd never stared that hard at another woman working there before. The jokes obviously didn't make me feel any better. The jokes halted altogether, though, when we began to notice a pattern. We noticed the only days he would come in would be the days when I was working. We started to suspect that he recognized my car. I never had the same schedule, but I always parked in the same spot in our very open lot. Because of this, you would always be able to tell it was my car if you knew so. The shifts that I would work were a little bit strange, too. There was a very, very dead time of day where we cut half the staff, giving us breaks that were a couple of hours long. On those days, he would come in twice a day if I was working. He would come in while I would work my morning shift, then come in again for my evening shift. While it could have just been a crazy coincidence, nonetheless, it began to freak me the fuck out. One night, after working a double shift on Saturday, I had walked out to my old beat-up car, which I almost never locked. Three out of the four doors on my car were broken in some way because it was so old, so it was easiest to just keep it unlocked at all times. I can admit, the car was such an old shitbox that no one would ever dare steal it. Maybe it wouldn't even be possible to steal it, so I never really worried about it. That was until this particular night. I was just climbing into my car when I immediately noticed a familiar stench. My car reeked exactly like that man. That same distinct smell of non-menthol cigarettes and cow shit was all around me. I was convinced that man had been in my car that day. After that, I had to have someone escort me to my car every night for a while. 
I haven't seen that man since last year, but I still get chills just thinking about him. This happened just over two years ago, at the end of my first year of university. I'm a woman, and at the time, I was 21 years old. My university is in a very large city, and I was living in university accommodation, a short walk away from the main campus. My flatmates had all finished up their exams and gone home for the summer, so I was there all alone in my flat. I was pretty stressed out, because I was in the middle of my first round of university exams. I decided that it wouldn't be prudent to waste my precious study time cooking. So instead, I ordered a large pizza from a large pizza chain. It was about 8.30 in the evening when my pizza arrived. So just on the verge of getting dark, my block of flats had a keycard entry system, so the pizza delivery guy couldn't just come right to my door. I saw his car pull up outside. As I mentioned, this is a fairly big chain, so their cars were easily recognizable. I went downstairs to go get my pizza. The delivery man stepped out of his car as I walked over. He was tall, stocky, and looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He handed me the box. Oh, thanks, I said, and made to walk away. The delivery guy, however, seemed to have other ideas. Hey, you're really pretty, he called out to me. I wasn't sure how to respond, so instead I just said thanks again. Then, most disconcertingly, he asked this. Are you home alone? It sure looks like it. This set off my creep alarm right away, so I told him I was not. Clearly, though, my order was meant for only one person. I was in a largely deserted block of flats at the very end of the school year as well. He deduced pretty easily that I was lying. I was thoroughly creeped out at this point, so I turned around to walk back to the door of my flat block. As I walked away, he wolf whistled and called after me. Wow, nice ass. Wanna have some fun? As I walked up the steps, he continued to whistle, whoop, and follow behind me. Needless to say, I closed the door in his face and locked the door to the block of flats, then the door to my flat, then the door to my room as well. Had this happened more recently, I would have called the pizza place right away to report the incident. At the time, though, I was not in the best state of mind, so instead I ate my pizza and put the whole incident in the back of my mind. I felt pretty uneasy about the fact this guy now knew where I lived. Moreover, the other residents of my flat block were wont to let strangers in easily, which made me even more uneasy. The next few days passed without further incident. I finished up my exams and went back to my parents' house for the summer. When I arrived home, I decided at last that I ought to call the pizza place and report this creepy employee. I did so, and the young woman who answered the phone sounded horrified when I explained the situation to her. She immediately handed the phone over to a manager. He took the details of my order, presumably so he could ascertain who delivered the pizza, and apologized profusely. When I heard back from the pizza delivery place, they said no one by that description even worked there. This was a few years ago. It was pretty laid out, past 1.30 or 2 a.m., I believe. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive, and he had gotten really jealous at this party we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we'd gotten home, he tossed me out onto our front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside. I was still wearing what I'd worn to the party, and it was freezing out that night. I wasn't sure what to do. He had my phone, my purse, and my wallet in the house with him, so all I could do was sit on the porch crying. When he turned off the lights both outside and inside, I knew he was not going to let me back in. I felt so helpless and cold. I thought about knocking on a neighbor's door, but I had anxiety about waking any of them up and causing trouble for my boyfriend. Instead, I decided I would try to walk to this gas station and motel less than a mile away so I could use their phone to try and call a girlfriend of mine and see if I could sleep over with her instead. 
Ironically enough, the road I was walking on, Donner Pass Road, was so freezing cold that it was fitting. But anyway, a little bit into the walk, this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stop and begin to make a U-turn. My heart began to pound fiercely. I froze up and forced myself to speed walk at the very least. And the truck pulled up to me, and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late at night. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station, and she was expecting me quite soon. He smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, citing that I didn't like to hitchhike. Well, that's good. I don't pick up hitchhikers or anyone. You don't look like a hitchhiker, though. You just look like someone who needs some help. He kept on driving next to me and told me I shouldn't think he was a creep. He pulled out what looked to be a police badge and told me he had just gotten off duty, which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. He said he wouldn't mind driving next to me, just to make sure I got to where I was headed to safely. I was very naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials. When he offered me a ride again, I said it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far anyway. He popped the door open and I hopped in. The radio was down low. It was a little bit messy inside. The ashtray was full of cigarettes and there were tons of newspapers lining the passenger floor. I was moving my feet when some of the paper shifted, showing a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, a highlight colored bandana, and some various other garbage. He apologized, saying it was a truck he took out hunting, but it was super warm, so I was happy for that. And I didn't mind the mess at all. He told me his name was John. He asked why I was so scantily dressed without a jacket. I started to tell him about the party and the fight I'd been in with my boyfriend. He was super charming and attentive. He even joked that he could go back and arrest my boyfriend right now if I wanted. I asked him about himself, and he told me about his family. He was a young dad, had a wife, daughter, a son, a dog. I told him it sounded like he had the perfect little family. He laughed and said he certainly did. It sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone, but he said no because he had to save up his battery as it was about to die. We were approaching the gas station when all of a sudden he just drove right past it. Oh, uh, I think that's the one. You just missed it. But he didn't answer me. I felt sick to my stomach. My heart began to pound. I started getting choked up, and my eyes started tearing up as I looked out the windows. I watched the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak, but somehow I murmured out, asking if he could please turn around. Instead, he ignored me. As I looked over to him, he just looked empty-eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed over. I looked back out the window and down the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remembered always hearing never go to the second location. I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be so much harder to get away with only one foot as opposed to two. I was debating with myself. Sure, there was snow on the ground, but then again, snow can be hard, especially when you're not fully clothed. I felt so dumb. I wasn't even tied up or anything, but I still couldn't do anything. There was nothing but trees and empty road and us too. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked him to please borrow his phone. He told me to shut up and stop talking. He then started talking under his breath. Girls shouldn't be out so late, you know. You shouldn't have been out alone. Look what you're doing to me, dressed up like a slut. He kept saying these terrible things to me. I wasn't even responding. I was just crying, trying to think past the fear I was feeling. I remembered the pair of handcuffs underneath my feet, so I used a little scooping motion to try and pick them up. I used it to push them under the bottom of my seat as far as I could. I was thinking of different ways I could try and help myself, if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, perhaps, maybe I could grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them. Maybe I could get the attention of a cop passing by or something, swerve and grab the wheel so he would appear to be a drunk driver and pull us over. I even had the thought that maybe this man was just having a weird night, how I didn't want to do anything to hurt him, but I told myself that sort of thinking got me into this mess in the first place. He pulled off the road where there were still woods on both sides of us, 
On his side, the wooded trees were closer to the road. On mine, there was a small gap fully covered in thick snow, just before the tree line. He turned off the car and coldly said there was something wrong with the engine and to get out right now. He grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car. I grabbed onto the center console and cried and pleaded for him to not make me get out with him because it was too cold with what I had on. He turned to face me, door still open, and shouted at me to get out right now. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console. I was crying. Please, John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything I'd ever heard. Humanize yourself. Use first names. He stared at me in this way I can't even begin to describe. I wouldn't even know how to start. He climbed back in the car. I slinked back toward my window, scared he would simply drag me out by force. He turned off the headlights, and everything went dark. He stared at the steering wheel for what felt like years. He lit up a cigarette and looked out his window, then back at me. He could hear the newspaper shuffling on the ground as I was adjusting my legs, but while still staring out his window, he asked me if I thought about running. He told me if I did, he had a quick way to get me exactly where he wanted me. Oddly enough, I had been thinking of running just minutes before that, but reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car, I should definitely stay inside. Otherwise, he'd simply chase me or shoot me. I think at that point, I finally hit the reserve of my courage, and instead of panic, there was simply numbness and exhaustion. There was still an occasional tear or two, but I just went completely numb. It was dead quiet. But finally, I just barely audibly told him that my friend was still waiting for me. I asked about his wife and children. He very plainly told me he didn't have either, and that his house was simply empty. I asked him what he was thinking about. I'm thinking about what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily, though. He just said it coldly, which sort of scared me more. I started getting worked back up and crying. At that point, he told me not to cry anymore and turned the car on, offering me some heat. I told him all I wanted to do was go home. Eventually, he started driving. He kept driving until we approached a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel, but before I could, he slowed down. While pulling up to the station, he told me not to tell anyone or he would come back for me. Then he told me all he was doing was teaching me a lesson to not hitchhike with strangers. He almost came to a complete stop when he told me to get out before he changed his mind. Before he could even get another look at me to assess my understanding, I had already thrown myself out of the truck and was sprinting toward the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me, but I stopped and remembered to try and see his license plate at the very least. I turned around and only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk behind the counter to call the police. I waited until the officer got there. And I'll be honest, I was a little bit scared I would see John once more. My fears melted away, though, when the new-faced policeman arrived. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and type, the parts of the license plate number I'd caught, and the fact he said he was an off-duty cop. Basically, any information I could. I asked him if he could look at the camera. The officer disappeared in the back for a little bit, then came back out saying there was nothing on them. I asked if I would be able to look as well. The officer said no, and asked if I didn't trust him. He then gave me a ride to my friends, lecturing me for hitchhiking. This mostly consisted of him asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was. He told me I was naive to think it could never happen to me. I never heard anything back about the report I'd made. I would try to follow up, but each time I did, they would simply ignore me. All aside from a single time, when they told me my case number didn't even exist. All that didn't stop me from trying to follow up, though. Throughout the months and years, I asked my friend whose home I slept over at that one night if she'd ever heard of any weird things or anything like that since that incident happened. If anyone up there had ever said anything about it. She always said no, though. I sort of let it go and tried to tell myself that maybe he actually was just trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean, I definitely never hitchhiked again, so if it was a lesson, it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case. I never heard any other odd experiences up there, so maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. Sometimes, though, I think I tell myself all of that to help me sleep better at night. It was all so real. 
Even if it wasn't real, though, I'm glad I didn't get out of that car into the woods that night. I live in a city in central Ohio that has a fairly big college I live next to. I actually attended a different college than the one I mentioned, though, and had to make a 20-minute drive from the city to that college. I also worked nights as a pizza delivery man in the city and surrounding suburbs. One night, I had an order in the town where the college I go to was located, which is a smaller suburban city northwest of where I actually live. This call occurred during what my coworkers and I referred to as the dead hour, which is just before the shop closed at 1 o'clock in the morning. I begrudgingly took the pizza, hopped in the car, and plugged the address into the GPS. As I did so, I noticed that this house was located off a back road in what looked to be an absolutely abandoned area. Not thinking too much of this, though, I drove up Route 315 I-70 East and exited, after passing through downtown, the cemetery, and the college, I drove through some sub-developments and then onto an even smaller road, at the end of which the house was located. The GPS notified me that I had arrived at my destination, but to my surprise, as I looked on, the house was completely boarded up. I noticed there was a small shed in the back of the house that had a tiny window, and there was a flickering light in that window. At this point, almost every red flag was going off in my head. Still, though, I knew my hard-ass boss would be pissed if I chickened out from the delivery, so I proceeded toward that mysterious shed. As I approached, I heard some rustling in the bushes next to the driveway. Then I heard a man whisper, Here they come, Billy. 45! 45! At that point, a man leapt out of the bushes, and two other men jumped out of the shed. They were all carrying knives and were wearing these long robes and white masks. I immediately took off sprinting and made it back to my car just in time. One of the assailants actually managed to slit my arm with his knife as I escaped. I could see them standing in the middle of the road as I drove away, looking absolutely pissed. I shot out of there down that abandoned road at 90 miles per hour, and I finally arrived back in the shop. When everyone got a good look at my bloodied up arm, they were shocked. After explaining everything that happened, we contacted the police and they dispatched a few officers to the house. When they got there, of course the assailants were long gone. They found some strange drug paraphernalia in the shed, some ropes and a bunch of other strange equipment as well. What they were to be used for, well, let's just say I have a bit of a hunch. This happened when I was about 14 years old. I had just started babysitting for a family in my neighborhood. They had two kids, a boy who was 10 at the time, and a girl who at the time was 8. They were great kids to babysit, actually. They got along really well with each other without fighting, and always did what I asked of them without any complaining. Before I launch into what happened, I'm going to give you some background information about this family's home so you can understand just why I was so freaked out. This house is situated pretty far back in my neighborhood, on this little side street just off the main road that runs through the neighborhood. The houses are in a cul-de-sac, so there's not a lot of traffic down this road at all. Usually, the only people who ever come are mailmen and people who lived in those three houses that were there. The street itself was not very long, so there was only space for three houses on each side of the street that weren't in the cul-de-sac. Essentially, despite being in a large neighborhood, the street that this house was situated on was very quiet and sparsely populated. If you didn't live in this area yourself, you might not even ever know that this street existed. It was a fall Friday night. I'm pretty sure it was late November, just after Thanksgiving, I believe. I arrived at the home around 6 p.m. The kids were already sitting down eating dinner when I got there. The parents told me they expected to be home around midnight or so. They also made a joke about how the kids had the whole street to themselves, since all the other families that lived there were out of town for Thanksgiving. 
The parents left, the kids finished eating, and went outside to play in the cul-de-sac area. I remember locking the front door and taking the keys outside with me. The kids played and had fun on their scooters for about an hour. I rushed them back inside after, though. For some reason, I felt really on edge as the kids were playing outside. I chalked this feeling up to knowing we were alone on these streets, since everyone else who would be there was out of town. After the kids finished playing outside, we went to play in the basement instead. I remember locking the front door once we were back inside, and putting the key down on the kitchen counter. I double-checked the front door as well before going downstairs to the basement to join the kids. I was super vigilant about checking the doors, because I had watched so many scary movies where a babysitter forgets to lock the door and some crazy murderer bursts into the home. As I was playing with the kids down in the basement, though, I began to get that unsettling feeling again. It didn't quite feel like we were being watched. It was more like that feeling you get when you know something's about to pop out in a scary movie. You're just anticipating it on the edge of your seat, with the tension at its absolute highest. The feeling was stuck on me the entire time we were in that basement, but again, I could only chalk it up to knowing the entire street was empty. The clock struck ten, and it was time for the kids to go to bed. We went to the top floor of the house, where the kids' bedrooms were situated. The house was set up so that when you open the front door and come inside, you're standing in the foyer, with the steps to go up to the top floor directly in front of you. If you're standing in that foyer, you can see all the way up the stairs into their bedroom. So the kids are in the bathroom, brushing their teeth and doing their nightly routine, when all of a sudden, I hear a car pull up into the driveway. I figured maybe it was their parents coming home super early, and I expected to hear the garage door open soon after, but that sound never came. I rushed over to the girl's bedroom window and peeked out her window to see what was going on. There was indeed a car in the driveway, and I could see a figure in the car, but the headlights were turned off, despite it being 10 p.m. and pitch black outside. Okay, well, maybe it was just someone who got lost in the neighborhood and was using the driveway to stop and get their bearings before heading back out on the road. I left the girl's bedroom and headed back to the bathroom where the kids were. All of a sudden, though, I heard a knock on the front door. I turned around and noticed the man now standing there, holding a pizza box. There are two long windows on either side of their front door, so I had a very clear view of this guy and I knew he had a clear view of us as well. Immediately, I felt that familiar, eerie feeling I'd been feeling all night long. I asked both of the kids if one of them had ordered a pizza behind my back for some reason, but they both said no. The kids had always been very honest, and wouldn't lie about something like that. They wouldn't even order a pizza without asking me, so I knew they must be being truthful. Normally, I would have gone downstairs to see what this guy wanted myself, Maybe he simply had the wrong address, and I could point him in the right direction. But there was a little voice in my head screaming, Don't go downstairs. Do not open that door. I could see some inconsistencies even from where I was already. The guy wasn't wearing a uniform that looked like he worked for any pizza company. Normally, they would be doing that, or at least have a hat with a company's logo on it or something. Or at least somewhere on the bag. This guy just seemed off. He was in his late 30s or early 40s, and he looked super disheveled. His shirt was wrinkled, his pants were filthy and ripped up, and he had this ratty black baseball cap that was pulled down super far so that his eyes were covered. He was also grinning very aggressively. I thought this guy's teeth might shatter in front of me, because how hard he was grinding them together. At this point, the kids noticed him as well, and started asking why this random guy was here. I told them to go back to their rooms and lie down so no one could see them. The boy rushed to his room, and I walked the girl to her room. I looked out the window at that car again. I took note that the car didn't have one of those pizza delivery car signs on top either, which all the pizza companies in my town required delivery drivers to have. Now, I was fairly confident of my initial intuition. This guy was not a pizza delivery guy. The girl climbed into bed. I went back out of her room and shut the door, and sat down at the top of the stairs so I could keep a close eye on this man. I tried to stay calm so as to not upset the kids, even though I was freaking out on the inside. 
He was just standing there absolutely still, holding the pizza box in one hand and grinning that teeth-shattering grin. Even though I couldn't see his eyes because of his hat, I could tell from the feeling that he was staring dead at me. Without even trying to check that I wasn't looking anymore, he began to jiggle the door handle while still grinning. I suddenly thanked God I was so psychotic about making sure the front door was always locked. When he noted it was, he stopped jiggling the handle and resumed staring at me. If I was in this situation now, I probably would have called police immediately, but being only 14 and fairly new to babysitting, I was paralyzed with fear. It felt like if I took my eyes off him for just a moment, when I looked back, he would be standing at the base of the stairs. After another five minutes of this stare down, he literally started walking backwards off the porch without once breaking eye contact, legitimately just walking backward toward his car while staring daggers at me. I rushed to the parents' bedroom, which also had a view of the driveway. I knelt down in front of the window and peeked out, expecting to see the man climbing back into his car. Instead, the man was nowhere to be seen. His car was still there, though. I returned to my perch. I returned to my perch at the top of the stairs, half expecting to see him at the door again or worse. He was nowhere to be seen. After about 30 minutes, I heard a car start up outside. I ran back to the parents' room, knelt down out of sight again, and noticed the car and the driver. The man was sitting in the driver's seat, still grinding his teeth. He also didn't turn the headlights on. He shifted in reverse and began silently backing out of the driveway, grinding his teeth the entire time. Just before he drove off, he turned his head, and I swear to God he made direct eye contact with me. I still couldn't see his eyes because of his hat, but it was so disturbing to me. He shouldn't know where I was inside that house. The parents' bedroom was the farthest window to the right. The lights in the room were off, and I was kneeling down as well. He didn't spend any time scanning the windows either. His head just snapped exactly to where I was. It was like he could sense I was looking at him. After I had time to calm myself down and collect myself, I started replaying what had just happened in my head and came to the following conclusions. 1. The guy was obviously not a pizza delivery guy. 2. Those 20 minutes or so that elapsed between when he walked backwards off the porch and to when he got back into his car, were probably spent walking around the whole house checking all the doors and windows to gain entry. He clearly had malicious intent. Maybe he wanted to rob the house, or maybe he wanted to do something sinister to me and the kids. Either way, this guy was some bad news. I'm glad I trusted the voice in my head. I think he probably just found some random pizza box outside and tried to pose as a delivery guy to get me to open the door for him. There are still parts of the story that are confusing to me, though. If he really wanted to get inside, why didn't he just grab a rock or a brick or something and throw it through the big window? I mean, I'm very glad he didn't, obviously. But I just thought it was a bit odd that he'd check the doorknobs and then give up immediately after discovering they were locked. Maybe he felt like that would make too much noise or something. Why did he walk backwards off the porch? To preserve eye contact? To intimidate me? Who exactly was this guy? I wonder if that feeling I felt earlier in the night was because he'd been watching us the entire time. Why did he pick that house specifically, given it was on a secluded street that almost no one would have known was there? There were 50 or so other houses you had to pass to even get to this one. And it's not like the area I live in is super affluent either. I don't know, maybe he was just on drugs or some crazy vagrant. So I'm a pizza delivery girl. Easy enough. I was at work around 9.30pm when this guy called in using a very whispery, breathy voice. I did my usual. Thank you for calling Pizza Hut. This is Karen. Uh, how are you doing tonight? After the usual exchange of small talk, I found out he was ordering for delivery. He was a new customer, so I had to put in all of his information fresh. I didn't notice anything weird initially. He told me he had a coupon for a pizza and asked if I could give him the discount. I told him I had to grab my manager so we could take care of that for him. He asked for me specifically to take care of him after I came back from dealing with my boss. I discounted him for his coupon and he thanked me. Here's where it started to get weird. 
He stopped me mid-sentence and told me I had a very nice-sounding tone of voice, and he just loved to hear me talk. You should be a disc jockey, he said. I was a little bit weirded out, but I tried to stay professional. I told him that was very sweet of him, and I would consider it in the future. I'd listen to your radio station. Thank you for taking my order tonight. I'll stop by your store and see you sometime soon, Karen. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but that isn't true. I noted that this man lived in an apartment complex. What I didn't realize is I'd taken his complex's address and not his individual apartment number. Not five minutes later, the man called back and my co-worker Bob answered the phone. I learned after the fact that he had asked for me by my full name. I picked up the phone and did my usual greeting, and he reminded me that I'd forgotten to ask his apartment number. I changed the information for him, but before I could hang up, this was our conversation. Hey, Karen? Karen? Uh, yes, sir, how can I help you? Are you doing all right? Yeah, I'm great. Good. I'm gonna hang up now. See you soon. Bob had heard the whole story and told my boss to have my male co-worker take the call instead of me. When Bob came back, the very first thing he said to me was that the man had been asking where I was the entire time. Okay, so I get there, right, and I knock on the door, and he says in this weird voice, come in. I'm not about to go into this random guy's house, though, so I knocked again, and he opened the door with this big smile on his face. When he saw it was me, though, it just dropped instantly. I greeted him, and he said, Oh, where's Karen? I told him you weren't going to be able to make it, and he got so angry. After I took his money and gave him his food, he asked how you were. I told him you were doing all right, and he just said, Good. Karen is a sweet girl. Tell her I'll see her soon. And the fact that he asked the driver to come inside, and that he was expecting me, really creeps me out. Maybe he's just a lonely guy who wants someone to talk to, but still... I'm going to add one more creep to my list. For my first job, I worked as a pizza delivery driver and dishwasher at a mom-and-pop pizza shop. The shop was within walking distance of my apartment, which I had just gotten alone. The shop was owned by a foreign man, his two nephews, and another friend of theirs. I was the only female in the entire building. The owner asked me to change into my work shirt the first day in the walk-in freezer. I declined and put it on in the bathroom instead. He supervised me delivering pizzas and put his arm around my chair, told me to join him and the workers after work for drinks. I politely declined, as I wasn't even old enough to drink. Then he began to ask if I had a boyfriend, which I did at the time. I told him yes, and that he lived in another state. He then offered his worker to sleep on my couch because he didn't have a place to stay, didn't even consult me. Obviously, I protested and declined. He also told me he knew my boyfriend's name, which I'd never told him before. As time continued to go on, things began to get even weirder. The owner would sometimes take me out back where there were no cameras and scold me for not pouring bleach onto the dishes I was washing. I told him that you can't do that, but he didn't seem to care. He would take me out back after my shift and compliment my eyeglasses and tell me how beautiful I was. I would say thanks, hurry away, and drive home. One time, he even came up behind me as I was washing dishes and licked the back of my neck. He then proceeded to tell me that since I lived alone, which I did not inform him of, I should be very careful. He stated he knew the exact layout of my apartment because his friend lived nearby. I told him I had a roommate at the time, which I didn't. He chuckled and told me he knew I was all alone and that he was going to break into my apartment one of these nights and attack me. I was completely stunned. I had four deliveries waiting for me to drop them off that night. On my way out the door, his nephew muttered something about me being a girl. I threw the bags into the car, promptly pulled over, and had a panic attack. I dropped all five pizzas off, and whatever else I was delivering, at the very first house I arrived to, I really couldn't give a fuck. I rushed home to my apartment, called my mom, and sat in the kitchen with a hammer for safety. Someone began to knock on my front door. 
I wasn't brave enough to look out and see who, but I already had a feeling who it was. The pizza shop number then began to call me repeatedly. I'd left my eyeglasses in the shop apparently, and had their pizza bags still. My dad went to the store instead of me, gave them their bags back, and threatened the owner, saying he had no problem going to jail if they continued to bother me. My dad retrieved my glasses. Months later, I ran into that guy's nephew at my college campus, and he proceeded to just stare at me while we passed each other by and continued to stare at me from then on. After these incidents, I got a huge 100-pound American bulldog to keep me safe. She did so very well until the day she unfortunately passed away. And that pizza shop is still open for business, and I'm still living in the same apartment. Needless to say, though, I never order pizza from that shop anymore. Right outside my apartment, smoking a cigarette, an unknown person snuck around a corner and sprayed me with pepper spray while I was looking down at my phone. I could make out a tall, thin man with a backpack rushing away with his hands in his pockets before I lost the ability to keep my eyes open altogether. There were no other people on the sidewalk in either direction. I hadn't seen the man's face. He didn't say a single word or try to take anything from me or grab me. He didn't even stick around to watch me be messed up. He just sprayed me in my eyes and walked away like nothing ever happened. I'm thankful I was able to feel for my keys and get back into my building. I started to realize that I could very easily have permanent damage if I couldn't wash this out of my eyes fast. I couldn't even find the key to my studio. That's how blind I was. I was starting to not be able to breathe. I rushed up the stairs and pounded on every door I could feel until my neighbor, who I'd never met before this moment, opened up the door for me. She let me into her bathroom and tossed water on me everywhere. I felt so terrible for just commandeering her space and bringing that horrid smell into her home. I'll be eternally grateful to that woman, though, for helping me and calling the police. They never found the guy. I'm wondering if this was just random or if this guy was waiting for me in particular. I still have no idea why he did that to me. I attend a college that's located in one of the poorest cities in Northern California. The campus is relatively safe, since the school employs its own department of public safety. But after the sun sets, it's a good call to just remain indoors. And that's when all the townies come out, and they tend to wander into campus somehow or another. Now, about two years ago, I was living in an apartment complex on the main part of campus, and I didn't have my own car yet. It was the end of the fall semester, and I was the last person in my apartment of three girls to finish taking my finals. And because of this, I was home all alone. I had just gotten back from taking my last exam and followed my usual routine of dejectedly collapsing into my bed to cry and sleep off the effects of pulling all-nighters. When I finally awoke once more, it was already past 10 p.m., and I was completely starving. Unfortunately, the student grocery store and cafeteria were already closed for the day, and I had nothing in the apartment to eat. I had no car to go get food elsewhere, either. I was woefully poking around in my fridge in the hopes I would find something substantial to tide me over, at least until morning. It was at that moment I noticed a Domino's coupon that someone had stuck onto the freezer. My stomach's pathetic cries for sustenance had been answered. I quickly decided there was no shame in ordering a whole pizza plus cine sticks for myself, because one, I was feeling ravenous, and two, the completion of finals demanded a celebration. And plus, if anyone happened to ask, I'd just lie and say I was sharing it with a friend or two, something along those lines. Anyway, I eagerly ordered up my feast for one, and provided the cashier with my address, apartment, and cell number. I typically never gave out my number to anyone, but I had ordered delivery from this Domino's in the past, and I knew they needed my number to call me once more when they were outside. 
those drivers would always get lost trying to navigate through campus. Although I can't say I particularly blame them. About 20 minutes later, I got the call. My food was here. For reference, it was close to midnight now. The campus was pretty much dead since most students had already gone home. The driver told me that he had parked in front of the dorm building that was right across the street from my apartment. I hustled out my apartment and was going down the stairs when I spotted the delivery guy waiting outside his car with my pizza. At that exact moment, my sense of caution kicked in. I slowed down my pace as my brain took in the fact that A, there were no other students out, and B, the lighting was really bad in this spot. Essentially, I'd be walking up to a complete stranger with his car that he still had his engine running right next to him. As I neared the bottom of the steps, I silently hoped he would cross the street and approach me so I wouldn't have to get anywhere near that area. Well, of course, that didn't happen. I made my way across the street and was finally able to get a good look at him. He was a relatively short Hispanic-looking guy, maybe 5 foot 7 or so. He was in his early 20s, and my nerves were getting bombarded by the creeper vibes he was giving off. I can only compare it to that vibe you get when you're out clubbing, and you suddenly spot some guy lurking in the crowd, you know, sporting the slick back ponytail, sunglasses, and oversized shirt, who just happens to be headed right in your direction. I did my best to appear calm and keep the mood light and friendly. He made some comments about how late it was, and how no one else was around. I quickly signed the receipt, gave him my thanks in an awkward smile, and hightailed it out of there as soon as he handed over my food. I could feel him watching me as I climbed the stairs back to my place. Once I got back into my apartment, I locked and chained the door and sat down on the living room couch to calm myself. After a few moments, I shrugged off the situation. Surely I was just being paranoid and my overactive imagination was acting up again. I just turned on the television and was about to take my first bite of the pizza when I got a text from an unknown number. I connected the dots pretty fast and matched the text number to the call I had received earlier from the pizza delivery guy. My initial reaction was shock, since nothing like this had ever happened to me before. That eventually melted away into laughter and disbelief when I considered him calling me sexy and my appearance in that moment. Like I had mentioned earlier, I'd just woken up from a nap after taking my last final. I was wearing a raggedy pair of sweatpants with a bunch of holes, a loose sweatshirt, and my hair was tied in a messy ponytail. My face was probably greasier than the pizza. Definitely not a pretty picture. The next morning, I got a call from my boyfriend John and casually told him about that pizza delivery driver, who casually signed his name in the text as Phil. I also told him all the events that transpired the previous evening. After sheepishly trying to defend my actions on the basis of poor judgment caused by extreme hunger, John convinced me to report his weirdness to campus police, at least as a precautionary measure. I gave them a call, and an officer stopped by my apartment a few hours later. I relayed my story. He took some pictures of the text messages and wrote down Phil's phone number. The officer then told me he would contact the Dominoes if I wanted him to, but it would most likely result in Phil's termination. So far, I didn't really think the whole situation was that big a deal, honestly. I told the officer I just wanted to make sure that he wouldn't do this to me or anyone else again. At the same time, though, I didn't really think it was bad enough for him to lose his job or anything. The officer started asking questions about how I felt after my encounter. Questions along the lines of, Did you feel threatened by Phil? Do you feel safe in your apartment with the knowledge he has both your phone number and your exact address? I began to get a little more scared during the course of my questioning. I had broken out in a cold sweat as my traitorous imagination began conjuring up all sorts of dastardly situations. I ended up giving the officer the go-ahead to pursue my case and contact the Dominoes. About a month later, while I was at home celebrating the holidays, I got a call from my boyfriend. I had left him the keys to my apartment so he could store his bike there and crash in my room while I was away. He told me that he had stopped by my place but couldn't get in because the keys were not working for some reason. It looked like someone had broken in. There was glass on the floor and a wooden board across my living room window. I was pretty upset, so I called the school the next day to figure out what the hell happened. 
Housing transferred my call to the Public Safety Department, and the officer I spoke with was only able to tell me that according to the records, a maintenance worker had called them two days after I headed home to report that broken window. Public Safety had responded by boarding the window and changing the lock when they noticed it had been tampered with. I convinced the officer to let my boyfriend in to check if anything was stolen. Nothing had been moved at all. I knew who did it. It was Phil who tried to pick my lock and broke my window. It scares me even more when I consider the fact that nothing was stolen. My flat screen TV was right by the window that had been broken, and my boyfriend's fancy road bike was sitting right there in the living room. Why hadn't he stolen anything? His intentions were to break in. Maybe to try and get revenge on me, the girl that had cost him his job. Would this still have happened if I had not given the officer permission to pursue the case? I didn't try to spend too much time speculating about what his true intentions were, but whatever I think about it, it still makes my heart race when I think about what could have happened if I'd still been in my apartment around that time. This was about six months ago, in the summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Here, I tend to order a fair bit of pizza, since hunger is a thing. Pizza is pretty much my only option for delivery, and since I don't have a car, I can't drive to get something myself. I'm the kind of girl who doesn't wear pants if I don't have to. Even if the weather is 25 degrees, no pants for me. I have one pair of shorts that I love to wear, but I only ever wear it around the house. Obviously, I put those on, as I was expecting a pizza delivery person, and I couldn't exactly just open the door in my underwear. I opened the door and accepted the pizza, and began to eat my dinner by the television. Not too long into my meal, though, I got a message on my phone. I've deleted the messages since, of course, but in the first message, this sender called me by my name. That was pretty strange, as anyone who knew me referred to me by my nickname. They asked if I was home alone, with a winking face. Okay, well, this was pretty creepy. Who exactly was this person? Between me asking who on earth this could be, and how they'd gotten my number, probably a mistake on my part, they began to describe exactly what I was wearing. I started to get a horrible sinking feeling. This person had my number, my name, and knew exactly how I was dressed. I realized the only way they could possibly know this is if they were the guy who just delivered my pizza. I had to use my name and number to order, and if that was the case, this person also knew where I lived. I put the number into Google and checked the first few results that came up. I saw the person was a local, and I had actually seen this person around before as well. Realizing they were in my part of town was the worst part, as they were in the perfect position to stalk, harass me, or continue to be creepy. I drew up all the blinds, crawled into bed, and pretty much made myself into a blanket burrito. I stayed as still as I could for a few hours. I was scared out of my wits. They did keep trying to contact me over the next few days, but luckily I didn't hear from the person again after threatening them with police action. So I work at a pizza place, usually inside, as my insurance does not cover claims when driving for business. Occasionally, I will cover a delivery shift for one of the drivers, though, because the money is pretty good. The delivery area includes a few new developments, upper-middle-class cookie-cutter neighborhoods, an older 1940s Arab village, two apartment complexes, some trailer parks, and a bunch of more rural areas, not exactly to the point of seeing hundreds of stars at night or anything, but enough that you couldn't hear your neighbors if they were to yell. About a week ago, I was covering for one of these shifts. I come back to the shop feeling pretty good. I was averaging $5 a delivery, and they'd all been pretty close as well. I checked to see if we had any more outgoing deliveries. All of a sudden, I saw an address I had never seen before. We mostly only had regular customers, so an address that didn't seem the least bit familiar was somewhat out of the ordinary. It was out on one of those more rural roads. I asked the kid who'd taken the order what was up, 
because there was a special instruction on the ticket as well. He said the person who called said to go around back because the front door, I guess, was inoperational for some reason. Okay, well, that wasn't uncommon. People often want you to go around the back. Either they're painting the front door, the house has shifted and it's a bitch to open, or they just like hanging out in their backyard. Whatever. So, as I'm driving out to this house, I get an odd feeling. I really didn't like the idea of going to the back of some house, way out in the sticks. It would be all too easy for some thugs to order a pizza to an abandoned house. There are quite a few of those in the more rural areas. Then they jumped the delivery guy, obviously. I figured I'd scope the place out a bit when I got there first. If it seemed too sketchy, I'd just call them and make up some bull about how it's against company policy to go around the back of houses to prevent robberies. As I'm driving up, I realize it's toward the end of this road that gets less and less populated the further down you went. Great. I was pretty near the address now, and I started to slow down. I came upon this house. An abandoned looking building, set up from the road with no address and surrounded by a bunch of trees. I thought to myself, this house better not be it. I drive past and check the next house's address and lo and behold, the abandoned looking one with no number seemed to be the right house. Well, fuck this. At this point, I was not super worried though. Out in the boonies, the standards of houses are pretty low, so a house in disrepair is not too unusual. I doubled back to this house and pulled into the driveway. I started getting bad vibes immediately. Something didn't feel right. I parked my car at the very end of the driveway, with the rear of the car on the shoulder, so anyone passing by could very clearly see it. At this point, I called back into the shop and told them the house was very sketchy. If I didn't call back in four minutes to call me, if I didn't answer to call the cops. While I was on the phone, I took a chance to observe the house a little bit closer. I could see now that it looked extremely abandoned, not just in disrepair. The driveway itself was disintegrating. There were weeds growing out of the gravel. No mailbox, no trash can, no car, no landscaping, no toys, absolutely nothing in the yard. It looked like it hadn't been mowed in years. With a closer look, I could see the roof was falling apart and the siding was falling apart as well. The back deck, which came around to the side, had almost disintegrated completely. The only part of the house that looked even a little bit decent was the allegedly non-functioning front door. The windows were all closed shut and all had the blinds and curtains drawn as well. A few were actually boarded up. I couldn't even see any electrical wiring running to this house. It wasn't dark completely, but it was dusk. There were no signs of any lights around. I was starting to get very nervous. I'm a 5'10 male and 180 pounds. I'm not in super great shape, but I'm not a complete wimp either. I'm not helpless, but I do try to avoid any sort of confrontation. I wasn't too concerned about getting robbed. No skin off my teeth. That's not my money anyway. I mean, I'd rather not, sure. What I was mostly worried about was getting jumped and killed. It was a fairly safe area, but recently there had been some more rather unsavory people moving in from the city. A big spike in home invasions and robberies. Even more worrying, a few stabbings and assaults as well. It was time to either nut up or shut up, though. I was not about to go charging in there like a fool, so I got out my phone and called the number they'd given when ordering. While I was doing that, I was also getting the pizza out and making sure to leave my door open. A running car half in the road and an abandoned house with the door wide open looks really suspicious, right? If shit went down, at least it would look out of place enough to make someone stop. Not that there was any traffic this far down the road. I was starting to walk up to the house as the phone continued to ring. It rang twice and then an automated message started to play. This number is associated with an internet texting app. The free ones you download that let you send free texts from a different phone number over a data connection. I think it was Haywire or something. We'd had issues with people using numbers from those services for pranks in the past. This was a huge red flag. My heart was pounding in my throat and my whole body was telling me to bail. Still, I didn't want to get a reputation of being a flaky driver, 
and lose any potential for future delivery shifts. That's why I'd not bailed yet. I'm just standing there holding the pizza, looking at this house but not daring to venture around the back. I was hoping the resident would look out the window and come out by the road to get their food. I'm looking in through the front windows, checking for any signs of life. At this point, I see a blind pop up on one window next to the front door, and a really creepy looking guy with a hat pulled over his face and huge sunglasses looking out. There was no reason for him to be wearing those. I could see a big guy standing right behind him in the room too. When he saw me looking, he mouthed something and darted away, presumably toward the allegedly broken front door. At this point, I got the fuck out of there. I had stayed close to my car, so it was only a few steps away. I jumped into the driver's seat and threw the pizza into the passengers. That was something I would never really do, since I was really anal about keeping my car clean. I slammed into reverse before I even got the clutch all the way in. I grinded my gears a little. Again, something I never did without looking. I simultaneously slammed and locked my door and floored it backwards onto the main road. I didn't even check for cross traffic. Really stupid on my part. I started to drive away and looked back toward that house. The screen door on the outside of the front door was now open, but the front door was still shut. The guy wasn't out in the yard yelling or anything. He'd seemingly just disappeared. I pulled over a little ways up the road and called back to the shop. I told them I was fine, and I'd tell them everything else when I got back. Those people never called back to inquire about their food. People will usually call irate if the pizza's 15 minutes late. These people never got it at all, so it's really strange they never called. Pretty much a confirmation they were up to no good. After telling the co-workers about it, we concluded it was definitely a robbery at the very least. We put the address and phone number on our no deliveries list, and we all shared the pizza together. Now, I doubt I would have gotten murdered or anything like that. Robbed, maybe. A gun pulled with a little roughing up, sure. But it was still very unnerving. I easily could have gotten into some serious trouble just by doing my job, especially if the idiots took a slightly less abandoned house to stake out. When I was 10 years old, it was not uncommon for my siblings and I to dig around outside. On this particular day, I was tired out from the day before, and so I decided to stay inside this time. I would occasionally look outside to make sure everyone was okay and doing well. I was a paranoid small child due to some former trauma that I'd experienced when I was much younger. Well, after my third glance outside, I noticed that my cousin and brother were now standing at the end of the gravel driveway, talking to some pizza man, it seemed. I turned to my mother and asked her if we'd ordered pizza, maybe as a surprise or something. Immediately, my mom turned to the door and bolted outside screaming. The sounds of tires screeching could be heard. My mom rushed back inside with my brother, cousin, and sister. After asking what happened, my brother and cousin went on to explain that this random pizza guy, in his late twenties or so, had suddenly pulled up and asked the boys if they wanted some free pizza. Of course, being small kids, they were readily willing to accept such an offer. He told them the pizzas were in the back, and if they wanted them, they would have to climb into his car. That's luckily when my mom ran towards the car, yelling obscenities. Thankfully, whoever it was, was threatened enough by my mom that he sped off right away. Two weeks ago, I was home alone when the doorbell suddenly rang. I asked who it was, and the person outside called out. Oh, uh, it's pizza delivery. I hadn't ordered a pizza. When I looked out to peek at the person, they were indeed carrying a pizza box with them, but something about them was off. They didn't have a uniform or any other paraphernalia, or even a pizza bag. I didn't even see a car outside. I told the person I didn't order any pizza and he left in a hurry. I peeked out my window once again and saw him now across the street at my neighbor's home. 
I didn't really think anything of it at the time, since I thought maybe they were the ones who'd ordered the pizza, and he'd simply mixed up the address or something. I went back to what I was doing, which was playing video games at the time, I believe. Well, as it turns out, the guy robbed my neighbors that night. Pretty scary stuff. I probably could have stopped that if I'd called the police. But in the moment, I wasn't really thinking too deeply about it. Now that I take note of it after, though, in hindsight, he was carrying a little Caesars box with him, which is pickup only. This story took me quite a while to write out, as I'm not much of an author myself, and it's quite painful for me to relay. Hopefully, this will help someone, though, as it's something I've wanted to share for quite some time. It involves two days in my life that I'd always thought were very fun, but somewhat weird, and how, when I grew up and was told what really happened, they've haunted me ever since. It all started when my dad's business partner came to pick me up from school one day. I knew him as Uncle Todd, and although I wasn't expecting him, I trusted him completely when he told me that my mom and dad were busy and he would be in charge of looking after me for a few days. I remember feeling kind of reluctant to get into his car for some reason. After all, mom and dad hadn't told me anything about this. I didn't really want to be away from them. But then he started promising me ice cream, a Game Boy, all this fun stuff. He also told me mom and dad had said I could watch whatever I wanted on the TV and that I was allowed to stay up until whenever I wanted to. Music to a kid's ears, right? So I got into his car and we drove off to his apartment, stopping to get some ice cream on the way. Todd was serious about the TV thing too as he pretty much left me in his apartment on my own, for hours on end. I remember he seemed to be very stressed out about something. I always assumed it was just grown-up stuff or something like that. I didn't really care much. I had all the Nickelodeon and McDonald's I could ever want. And that's how I spent the first night. It was also weird to me that Uncle Todd's apartment was so small that we both had to sleep in the same room. I still wasn't questioning anything, though because he was such a regular part of my life, and I trusted him completely. The next day, after more McDonald's and a bunch more Nickelodeon, Uncle Todd came back super stressed once again and told me to get into the bathtub. I thought he meant that I could take a bath or whatever, but that's not what he meant. He walked me over to the bathtub and made me get inside without any water in it and without taking my clothes off either. I could then hear him talking into the phone in the other room, trying to keep his voice down. I could still hear, though, how angry and stressed out he seemed to be at the person on the other end. Eventually, he went silent, put the phone down, and went to grab me out of the tub. I remember him putting me back on the bed and telling me he was going to get more McDonald's and ice cream for me. Then, as he went to walk out of the room, he picked up this pokey-looking thing in his hand, obviously to take out to his car. I remember asking him what that was, and he told me it was a thing for getting his car started on cold mornings. It hadn't even been that cold that morning or the morning before, but hey, at that age, grown-ups know best, right? Anyway, a few hours later, he drove me back to my parents' place, and they gave him a present for looking after me while they were gone. My mom and dad seemed really happy to see me, and I was really happy to see them, too. They said they missed me, and I missed them a bunch as well. I didn't really think any further into it than that. It was only when I was all grown up that I was finally told what actually happened. You see, Uncle Todd and my dad really were business partners, but my dad was not exactly a good or honest person. He'd actually stolen a bunch of money from their business out from under Todd's nose, and he'd actually tried to rearrange some accounting so Todd wouldn't notice either. But Todd did notice and he got very angry about this. He told my dad to give it back, or he was going to call the cops. My dad told him he'd already spent the money, and if he called the cops and got him thrown in jail, he was never going to get it back. Pretty scummy, I know, but my dad is generally an awful person all around, so I won't go too far into that. Either way, Todd turned out to be way more of a psycho than my dad figured, 
because instead of calling the cops and getting him arrested, he came up with another plan to get his money back. That's how he ended up showing at my school and convincing me to get into his car. My dad tried to give Todd all these promises that he'd pay him back and get all squared off, but Todd wouldn't believe him. He wanted his money back and he wanted it soon, so he grabbed me and let my mom and dad sweat it out for a day. He told them that if they didn't give him the money in 24 hours, he was going to kill me. Not exactly the best plan, but like I said, Todd was kinda psycho. He fed me McDonald's, gave me ice cream, and let me watch as much cable as I wanted to keep me from leaving what turned out to be the motel room. That's why, for the longest time, I thought motels were places people actually lived, and not places where people only rented a room for a few days or whatever. Then, there's the whole bathtub thing. Todd put me in the bathtub that day and brought an ice pack because he was going to torture me while making my parents listen on the phone. That was what made them finally break, and they ended up selling a bunch of things and doing other shady stuff in order to get ten grand worth of cash together in the space of a day. When they called to say that they had the money, Todd finally took me back home and grabbed the cash, which I'd thought was a gift for taking care of me, and then we never saw him again. Mom and Dad got a divorce not long after, which was sad, but a few of my friend's parents had gotten divorces too. I knew it was a thing that moms and dads occasionally did. I had no idea it was because of all the stealing and the kidnapping. It was also because dad basically refused to go to the cops about what happened because he was too scared of going to jail himself. My mom just completely resented him after that. She also told me my dad told her if she tried to press charges against Todd, he was going to tell the cops she was in on the scam or whatever, and she would end up catching charges as well. Sometimes, I think she might have actually been part of it, and that's why she didn't go to the cops right away when she found out Todd had taken me. I don't know, a lot about the story doesn't add up, but since I don't see my dad anymore, and my mom is the only member of my immediate family I'm close to, I don't exactly want to confront her about it. So, yeah, that's the story of my super messed up family, and how one of the weirdest most fun times in my childhood turned out to be something completely horrible and kind of traumatic, honestly. In hindsight, it seems really scary, because I had no idea what was happening. It all seemed completely innocent, but I was minutes away from something out of a living nightmare, with my Uncle Todd doing all kinds of evil stuff to me in that bathtub, making me scream into the phone for my parents to hear. I wanted to tell you the story of a friend of mine named Angel. Angel is 19, and was honestly one of the brightest, cleverest, and most bubbly people I've ever met. She was obsessed with true crime stuff. She loved that TV program CSI, and wanted to join the police so she could get into the forensic side of investigations. She loved the idea of using science to catch horrible criminals, but we never thought she'd end up being the victim of one herself. She had everything going for her in life, but then she met her ex-boyfriend Jay, and we saw a change in her right away. Jay made everything about him, and he abused Angel physically and mentally until she made everything about him too. She was miserable with him, but kept talking like he was just a tortured soul who needed a girl like her in his life to help fix him. We had to intervene time and time again, to get her to see what a scumbag he was who'd never be good for anyone. He was only ever interested in himself. It took ages to do this, but we finally managed to convince her to leave him. She told us all in a group chat that she'd finally told him they couldn't be together anymore. We were all so proud of her, but she also said that she was terrified of something he'd do to get back at her for this. As much as we knew that her dad, Patty, would never let anything happen to her while she was under his roof, we knew that he also couldn't protect her all the time. We knew that Jay was terrified of Patty himself, as they'd almost gotten into fights a few times before. Patty was way bigger than Jay, and could easily beat the life out of him if it came to it, so he always stayed away from the house. Just not far enough. I remember the day we found out that Angel was in the hospital, we were all hoping it wasn't anything serious. But then we heard she'd been hurt in a very serious incident. 
she'd fallen out of a van that was going down the highway somehow. We all just knew Jay had something to do with it. As it turns out, Jay had recruited the help of one of his friends. They'd waited in a van near Angel's house, waiting for her to come out. When they spotted her, Jay ran out, picked her up, then carried her to the van and threw her into the back of it. We still don't know what exactly went on inside that van. He insisted in court that he hadn't just thrown her out, but whatever he was doing or saying, it had scared Angel so much that she somehow found a way to open the back doors as it was running down the highway. She must have thought her only chance of survival was jumping out the back of that van. Some people say Jay pushed her out the back as a way to kill her, but at his trial, his lawyers were somehow able to prove that he had not pushed her, and all he wanted to do was keep her inside the van. He must have admitted to wanting to kidnap or scare her into getting back with him, but I know Angel. She wouldn't have done something so drastic without being scared for her life. What happened next made it clear to me that the justice system in this country is just completely broken because the sentence he got was nothing of what he deserved to get. Recently, he got his sentence more than doubled after a big public campaign headed up by her parents. That's all good and everything, but it still feels like nothing because Angel's life is basically over now. She suffered serious head trauma after falling and being pushed from the back of the van, and now doctors think she'll be potentially disabled for the rest of her life. We don't know if she's ever going to walk, talk, or eat by herself ever again. Basically a death sentence. But the sentence Jay originally was going to get? Just over four years. Can you even believe that? This guy kidnapped his girlfriend, might have actually thrown her out the back of a van going 60 miles per hour, basically ended her life, and he was going to get out of prison in just four years. That's nothing. The driver of the van basically didn't get punished at all, and he also deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life. Angel once told me about a law in America, where if someone dies while you're committing a crime, your charge automatically gets turned into murder. I personally think we should have something like that here, too. It would make people think twice about doing things like kidnapping, or drunk driving, or anything that could end up ruining someone else's life. And this happened two years ago now, but honestly, it feels like just yesterday that we found out Angel's life was over. I do have a story to tell, but it's not something that happened to me. It's something that actually happened to our neighbors, back when we lived in Highgate in London. So, I myself wasn't scared for my own safety, but all the neighbors were scared for the family this was happening to, if that makes sense. Also, I've changed the man's name, because my mom reckons that his parents would probably never talk to us again if they knew I told this story. Anyway, their son was taking a gap year before he went to uni, and he ended up going off to Thailand for a few months during the summer. His parents kept in touch with him, of course, and he seemed to be having quite a lot of fun. Then, one day out of the blue, they got a phone call from some random guy from Thailand. He asked them something like, Are you Rob's parents? Obviously, they said yes. He told them that Rob had been kidnapped. If they contacted the police, they were going to torture and kill him, and if they didn't pay them within a set time limit, they were also going to torture and kill him. Not just that, they were going to feed his body to crocodiles, or sharks, or whatever else. Basically, so they'd never have a piece of him to bury. Pretty grim stuff, right? So Rob's mom was basically ready to get the money together right away. Anything to keep these guys from hurting Rob. His dad got in touch with the Thai consulate, and got the police involved. This caused absolute murder with the couple. No pun intended. There were some nights you could hear them screaming at each other in the kitchen, with Rob's mom screaming out, You've killed him! You've killed our son! I mean, it got really intense. Just to let you know, it all ended up basically okay, and thankfully Rob was not seriously injured. But get this, Rob's dad kept telling the kidnappers that he was having trouble sending the money over to the account they'd given him, as his bank kept flagging the transaction for fraud, he acted like he was more than willing to send everything, but he was just having trouble getting it over. 
That way, he could buy more time for the Thai police to track the phone calls and bank account number to the person they needed to arrest. In the end, Rob's parents got another phone call from the Thai police, telling them Rob had been found safe and sound, but that he'd been arrested for fraud or scamming charges or something. As insane as this might sound, it turned out Rob was never actually in any danger. He wasn't in some chicken wire cage or handcuffed to a bloody radiator or whatever. He was actually in on the scam himself. Long story short, he'd run out of money while over there and was too ashamed to ask for more. Instead, he turned to some locals who had a proposition for him. Pretend to be kidnapped, pose for a proof of life picture, and then split the ransom money 50-50 with these so-called kidnappers. Turns out it was a proper little industry where he was staying. And horrible little toe rag backpackers would scam their own parents and each other's out of thousands of pounds at a time. The exchange rate is massive between Thailand's and most of European and American currencies. So the kids would always be like, it's only a few hundred quid in our money or whatever, and then they just let them go. Then the ungrateful buggers got a few more weeks of traveling with money from their parents. I might have mentioned I don't live next to this family anymore, but as you can imagine, this caused a huge rift between the kid and his parents. I'm pretty sure it's one that's still not healed properly. I totally understand why, too. He put them through torture, all just because he was greedy and too proud to ask for more money for himself. Back when I was in year 10, I went on a school trip to Russia with our school's history society. We all thought it would be the adventure of a lifetime, but it turned out to be a complete nightmare for two different reasons. Firstly, we were on our way to our hotel in St. Petersburg, and it was terrible. We were basically on a couch for 36 hours straight, with a stop only every 12 hours or so where we could get some food and stuff. A trip to one country ended up being a trip through like seven different ones. But then, almost as soon as we crossed the border over into Russia, some weird stuff started happening. All of a sudden, right at dawn too, so most of the other kids were asleep already, the bus driver started raising his voice with our teacher, who then started to sound really scared. And that's when the beeping started. Two cars were on either side of the coach, one in front, one in back and they were flashing their lights and beeping their horns. Our teacher was telling the coach driver, who was a Russian guy, not to pull over just because he was scared of what the guys in the cars were going to do. The coach driver was saying that if he didn't slow down and stop then and there, there might be a crash. The car in front kept dangerously slowing down, trying to force us to a stop. As we started to slow down, we thought we were about to be kidnapped by the Russian mafia or something. It was honestly really scary. It turned out the guys that actually stopped us turned out to be people sent to warn us of that very thing. Apparently some rumors had been going around that we were being targeted for a kidnapping. And the guys who were beeping and honking had been sent as an escort by the hotel to protect us. And there was a big argument between our bus driver and the protection guys because they had guns with them. The driver and our teacher didn't want them to be on the bus with guns in front of us kids. In the end, we had no choice but to have them get on though, sharing the bus with us until we got to our hotel in St. Petersburg. The next thing was that when we were in our hotel at night, none of us were allowed to leave our rooms. If anyone did, the guys with guns would shout at us to go back inside immediately. We couldn't exactly understand what they were saying, but it didn't take a genius to work out what they meant. We went out sightseeing for two days, with this very same isolation at night. Then, one day, there was a switchover with the security team that was guarding us. All the guys we had come to recognize disappeared, and a new team took over. That night, the bus driver must have come back from going somewhere, and one of the security team challenged him in the hallway. Our teacher told us he tried to explain he was the bus driver, and he was a part of our group but the security guard who stopped him demanded to see some kind of proof of this. Obviously, he didn't have any other than showing his driver's license and uniform from the company he was from. Then, get this, 
Instead of just letting him go to get to his room, the security guys started beating him up. A few of the kids came out of the rooms to see what was going on and literally saw the security guy beating the life out of this bus driver. The driver then basically disappeared after. We were stuck in the hotel for another day. We were supposed to drive on to Moscow to see some of the sights there, so by the time we got another driver, we were already a day behind. At that point, we got the bad news that we wouldn't be going to Moscow at all. Our teacher had basically arranged for us to go back early. We were all gutted about that, but we also noticed something else. Our teacher seemed to be particularly shaken up about something. We all thought it was the whole battered coach driver situation, but it later turned out to be something else entirely. He didn't tell us what happened until we got back home, as he didn't want to scare us. Then, one day in our history society, the very last one before our exams, he told us what had happened and what the battered coach driver had told him. He gave us a little side note, saying he didn't know this for certain, but one thing was clear. He didn't want to put us in any further danger. The bus driver had told him the guys guarding us were all Russian secret agents or something, and there was never a threat of being kidnapped by the mafia. They were basically sent by the Russian government to keep an eye on us in case we were some sort of spy group in disguise. When he was being beaten up, the driver said one of the agents had called him a traitor who was in bed with the English, and that if he didn't make himself scarce, next time he'd be taken somewhere secret and disposed of. That's why he refused to drive us anywhere else, and why he disappeared soon after. As our teacher said, it could have been the bus driver just being dramatic, our teacher also confirmed, though, that when the security team had been asked to show credentials, any kind of document or card to confirm they were private security, they refused to show anything. They also refused to tell us any of their names, where they were from, or answer any questions at all. Our teacher said that the whole thing was one of the most unnerving experiences of his life, and it made it all scarier to think that he had to protect us 20-plus kids from the Russian Secret Service. He was terrified they'd just randomly detain us or lock him up and leave us all alone if he didn't do exactly what they told him. The whole thing caused a big drama in our school, and loads of parents of kids who went on the trip were up in arms about how they could put us in such danger. It was definitely the craziest thing that happened to me in all my school years, and that's my scary story about the time we visited Russia. A few years ago, me and a few friends went to Russia for a Christmas vacation. First thing we did after such a long flight was head out to a bar. We started trying out the different flavors of vodka. When it was our turn to get drinks, we started to try to speak Russian. But the bartender immediately smiled at us and asked, American? Turns out his English was really good, so we replied to him in English. Yep, we're American. Don't hold it against us, please. He just laughed and made a peace sign with two fingers, then asked what we were doing in Russia. I told him we were on vacation, then asked him for five shots of the chili vodka. Two European guys at the bar started talking to my friends and I, and suggested playing the I Never game. Both of the guys were bragging, saying how much they could drink and how pretty we all were. They even joked that since there were no boys with us, they should pretend to be our boyfriends to keep all the creeps away. We excused ourselves to the bathroom. Then, instead of finding generic male and female toilets, we were greeted with just one individual bathroom. When we looked inside, we found ourselves staring in on five guys, all dressed in suits and sitting down at a small table. They straight away turned their heads towards us and said something quickly in Russian. That's when I noticed guns laying on the table, which they were pointing at us. Oh, I'm so sorry, we were just trying to find the toilets, I remember saying. We tried to make a quick getaway. Another guy kind of did a half smile and said in perfect English, I'm sorry for my friend here, but the real toilets are the way you came. I could show you, if you like. My friend Deb, now holding my hand, slowly edged backwards to where we came from. Thank you, but I'm sure we can find it on our own. We just wanted to get the hell out of there. We shakily left that area and were soon engulfed by people once again. We went back to the bartender and explained we couldn't find the toilet 
and we'd nearly gotten shot while trying to do so. I explained how the guys looked, and that it was very odd that there wasn't anyone else but them in there. Oh, that's fine, don't worry about those guys, said the bartender. Uh, so, who are they? Oh, they're the local mafia, nothing to worry about. Another vodka for you? My friends and I were just standing there with our mouths open after hearing that. I wanted to leave and go to the hotel bar. How could this bartender be so casual and laid back about this? I know it might not seem like much of a story to everyone else, but who can honestly say they nearly got shot by some Russian mafia guys in the bathroom? My name is Katarina, and I'm from a place called Chelyabinsk, Russia. I'm sorry if some of my English is not perfect. The point of this is to tell you a story of the day I thought the world was ending. It was in the morning of the 15th of February, 2013, since I was still in school, back then in morning classes. We were studying some old Russian writers. That morning, we were reading a book by Maxim Gorky while discussing the themes of his writing. It was nice, clear weather outside, but even at past 9 a.m. in the morning, it was still mostly dark in the wintertime where I live. Because of this, when our classroom suddenly started to light up very quickly, almost like the sun was rising, some people looked to see what that was. All of a sudden, all I could hear were people gasping and saying, my God, my God, again and again. Then I looked too, and this is what I saw outside. There was a huge ball of fire flying down through the sky. As it got closer and closer, it got brighter and brighter, until it flashed so bright it hurt our eyes. Then it went out altogether. A few seconds later, we heard a huge explosion, and then everything went quiet. The next thing I remember was our teacher rushing us to get away from the windows. Of course, no one listened. She began to scream about how the glass might break at any moment and slice us up, so we all backed off and tried to shield ourselves behind our desks. She had been completely right, of course. The next thing we felt was though we'd been hit by a gigantic shock wave. The glass from the window shattered all at once and flew inward towards us. There was so much screaming and shouting. We were all terrified. There were even people in my class asking, Was that a nuke? Are we at war now? Our teacher tried his best to keep us calm, but even he was shaken and scared by what had just happened. We were all wondering what we should do. Our teachers told us very calmly to leave the upper floors of the building we were in and meet up at the school sports area since it was a very sturdy and strong brick building. We all rushed outside together. We smelled this strong burning smell, and that scared us even more. I remember one of the boys in our class saying, It's definitely an American nuke. You can smell stuff like this when one explodes. He had no idea what he was talking about, of course, but at the time, it made all of us so scared. Our eyes were stuck on the sky, expecting more fireballs to fly out over our heads any moment. We were all terrified. We thought it might be the end of the world. I know now, though, that it was just my fear doing the talking for me. All of the students met in the sports area, and we listened to the radio to find out what was happening. That's when we found out that we were safe, and it was just a meteor having exploded in the atmosphere. Some other people in Chelyabinsk and other areas had not been so lucky, though. The meteor's explosion had hurt people, and even destroyed some buildings. I heard later that more than a thousand people had to go to the hospital because of injuries caused by the explosion. When it had burst in the atmosphere, it exploded almost like a hand grenade, sending pieces of rock shrapnel flying everywhere. Some people had been hit directly by these pieces, or they'd crashed through windows and roofs, and people were cut by glass and debris. One person even had a broken back from being hit directly by a larger piece. I don't know if they passed away or not. More than 200 people were blinded by the flash or suffered a burning in their eyes for a short time because they'd been unfortunate enough to be looking at the sky when the ball of fire exploded. Those people had been much closer than we were, 
And so, because of this, I think me and my class were very lucky that morning. The people that were closer to the explosion had been burned from how brightly it shined when it blew up. They called those flash burns. We were told it was the very same type of effect that happened when the USA dropped nuclear bombs on Japan. So although it wasn't a bomb itself, it had very similar effects. We also heard that a school that was much closer to the explosion was hit by a blast wave. One of their teachers was cut by flying pieces of glass. Thank God she managed to survive. Some people say she saved all their lives by shouting at them to get cover under tables. Her students were a lot younger than us. I can only imagine how terrified they must have been. Afterwards, people in the government suggested working with the Americans to invent some kind of early warning system for meteors. It was very alarming that they could just strike so completely without warning. So far, I don't think this will happen. People are so concerned with fighting each other on Earth that they don't look up into the heavens to see what's coming for us there. And that new movie, Don't Look Up, reminds me of this. I know it's not supposed to be literal, but for me, the threat of meteors was very literally real that day, as my home region had actually been hit and scarred by one. Let me start off by saying I'm a 16-year-old male and an only child who lives in a quiet rural area surrounded by fields in Amish country. I'm going to use the alias John for this story. One Saturday evening, after an afternoon of occasional rain showers, I was home alone while my parents were out for their anniversary. They had just recently left to go out, when I decided to take a walk now that the rain had stopped for I don't know how long. I go into my garage, slip on my shoes, and head on out our sliding back door in our kitchen. The backyard was large and fenced in as we used to have some dogs. There was a gate in the fence just off the patio that leads to our underground swimming pool, then another that leads into the side of our yard. I exited through there and headed down to my driveway and onto the road. I was out for maybe an hour or so when I finally returned from my rather simple exercise of walking up and down the road while waving to any friendly neighbors I saw. I walked towards my side yard when I noticed that the gate I'd exited out of earlier was still open. I must have forgotten to close and secure it, I thought to myself. It was a bit windy that day, so perhaps the wind had opened it up because I'd forgotten. Oh well. I headed through the gate, through our pool area, back onto the patio, and in through the sliding glass door. Later on, as the night began to set in further, I had just finished baking and eating half of a frozen DiGiorno stuffed crust pepperoni pizza when I heard one of the fence gates slowly creaking open. Obviously frightened, I thought at first maybe it was my mom or dad coming home early. They'd always call me when they were on their way home from wherever they were at though, so that surely couldn't have been it. I ran throughout the house and locked every door and window. I waited and listened in my kitchen for any further suspicious sounds. After about five minutes of not hearing anything else, I thought maybe it had just been my imagination, or maybe I'd again forgotten to lock the gate on my way in and the wind had blown it open again. I decided to quickly head outside and check it out. By now, it was completely dark and cloudy, so I grabbed a flashlight out of a drawer in the kitchen and crept out the front door. Once I was out on my driveway, I shone my flashlight down the side yard towards our shed. Okay, nothing there. So far, so good. I walked down the side yard slowly and was pointing my flashlight in every direction, keeping myself aware of my surroundings. Once I finally crept up to the gate, I saw it was wide open. Ah, must have forgotten to lock it again, I thought to myself. I face palmed. I shut it and locked it, then turned around to head back towards my driveway. All of a sudden, though, I noticed something out of the very corner of my eye in the darkness. My heart dropped as I shined my flashlight quickly towards my backyard and caught a glimpse of the backside of somebody walking behind my shed. From what I saw, I could make out that this was a person with dark hair wearing a black hoodie and sweatpants, and they appeared to be carrying something in their left hand. 
I could just barely make out what appeared to be the blade of a knife or some sort of small, sharp instrument. At this point, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to confront this person or go inside and call my parents. I stood frozen for a few seconds, hand trembling, as I finally decided to call my mom. After two rings, she picked up. Hello, John. You need something, sweetheart? She asked. I felt a bit more comfortable now. Yeah, Mom, I think there's someone in our yard, I said, taking a deep breath. My mom gasped, and her voice got a bit frantic. This was the first time something like this had ever happened. Where are you now? I continued looking out towards my shed, now lit up by the flashlight. I could no longer see the person anywhere. I'm out on the driveway. I heard the gate open and went outside to check it out. I saw someone. He was walking toward the back side of the shed and carrying something. I think it's a knife or something like that. My mom gasped again, and this time I heard my dad ask what was wrong. She told him what happened as I stood there and eyed for any movement. We're heading home right now. Call 911. Don't go chasing him or anything stupid like that. All right, Mom. I'm going back inside right now. After exchanging our farewells, I turned around to rush back into the house. Once I turned the corner to head back to my front door, though, I saw somebody walking down the road right in front of me. My heart sank as I stood there in shock, ready to flash my flashlight at whoever this was. The person stopped walking and stood still for a couple of seconds before slowly turning their head in my direction. They must have heard me walking as well. I instinctively whipped the light up and shined it at the person's face. It was a male. I don't know how old, dressed in a black zip-up hoodie and black sweatpants. No doubt it was the same person I'd seen behind my shed. I could only see one of his eyes, as the other was completely covered by something. He looked at me with this blank, expressionless face. It almost felt like he was glaring directly into my soul. This time, I didn't see his knife, but he did have his hand in his hoodie pocket. Without a single word or facial gesture, he slowly began to walk backward before turning around and continuing down the road. After a few seconds, I ran up the road in front of my house and peered down it. I didn't see him anymore. He must have entered someone else's yard. I ran back inside and waited for my dad and mom to get home, as I called police in the meantime. Once a state trooper arrived, I told them everything, from the gate being fondled with to the encounter I'd had with him in front of my house. The trooper told me there had been several calls in the past few months about a person matching that description I gave them, being spotted in several different areas, acting very suspiciously. That interested me greatly, I must say. I tried to ask him more about it, but he declined to answer. Once my parents arrived, they talked with the trooper a bit before he finally left. Afterwards, my parents and I talked about what happened before sitting down to watch a movie, which made us all fall asleep together. Nothing much changed after that night, though. I still live here, and my parents still let me stay home alone, but we've gotten a home security system just in case, and I'm more vigilant whenever I'm by myself. The illumination of a creep's light shines on for anyone with intuition to see. That means that when someone isn't quite right, sometimes you can just feel it in your bones. I was working at a pizzeria in Seattle. It was a cold, rainy day in fall. Not many people order from a place that doesn't deliver when the rain is so unforgiving. My shift was spent enjoying the sounds of the rain and shooting the shit with my co-workers because of this. Perhaps doing my job every now and then, when someone actually decided to walk inside. Every person that made a choice to step through that door showed their decision with tangible evidence on them, in the form of leaving sopping wet puddles everywhere and being completely sucked, like Hansel and Gretel with a breadcrumb trail to lead them right back into the storm. We were getting ready to close up shop when this one man came in. The rain clung to each strand of his hair, some of the drops slid down his big pores, creating big wet streaks on him. It seemed he'd been out in the rain for quite a while. He stared at me for a second before I began speaking. Welcome to so-and-so, 
How are you today? Pizza. I want some pizza. Anyone that's been in customer service can tell you that the question, how are you, commonly gets overridden by the customer's own question or request. Basically, they completely ignore it. I think sometimes they believe we say it because we just like the way it sounds or something. All right, sir, I said. I looked at him with my pen in my hand, ready to write down whatever he wanted to order. But he didn't order. Instead, he just stared at me, and stared, and stared some more. Finally, after what felt like enough time for our entire species to go extinct, he said, Give me a pepperoni slice. I took his order, he paid, I smiled and gave him his change, but he didn't go anywhere when I handed it to him. Usually, people would want to sit down or wait in the dining area, but instead he just stood by the counter watching me. I would turn around occasionally, feeling his eyes focus on me with more interest than I've had for anything in my whole life. He didn't even blink either, he just would not stop staring. You got a boyfriend? He said. Yes. You're lying. My heart dropped. Why or not, no one with good intentions calls out someone rejecting them because they're obviously uncomfortable. A decent person will let this slide and accept the fact that they just weren't into you. Well, I'm not lying, but I guess you can believe whatever you want, I told him. There wasn't much noise until my co-worker wandered out from doing dishes. He started talking to me and making eye contact with the strange man who was staring at me. The look on his face told me something didn't feel right to him about this situation either. Thankfully, the pizza slice was done quickly. Longest five minutes of my life. I handed it to him. You need a ride home? He asked me. No, I'm fine. You shouldn't have to take the bus in the rain, he responded. I have a ride, so thanks, but no thanks. Oh, come on, it's not like I want to rear you or something. I'd just take you home. That's when my co-worker said loudly that he would be taking me home, so the guy could just leave right now. The guy kept insisting, asking why we wouldn't just trust him to take me from work to my house, and we kept saying it was not necessary. He kept continuing to press. He kept saying things like, She would come back to work the next day, man. I don't know why you're being so weird about this. We kept on telling him no, and he was getting visibly frustrated. He went back to his big black truck, parked right outside the shop, and just sat there and watched me for a good hour as we closed up. I did have a knife, pepper spray, and a taser, so I wasn't too afraid, at least while I was inside. My co-worker was not a small dude either, and wasn't afraid to defend someone in need of help. I was more concerned he would follow me to my house and try to break in after Luckily, when he saw I was not going to come outside, he eventually just drove away. I didn't put this together until after the fact, but when he said you shouldn't have to take the bus home, not once had I ever mentioned that I took the bus home, and there were plenty of cars in the lot as well. I feel like he must have seen me, or been watching me before without my knowledge. I never saw him again after that, but I did occasionally feel like someone was watching me. Here's hoping I never meet him face to face again. My high school held an annual Euro tour, and I went on my first one in 2011 when I was 16 years old. There would always be a bunch of teachers and parents that came along to supervise, including our headmaster. Almost everything was scheduled, but we did get a few hours every day to go and explore the cities ourselves. The tour was always 12 days long. This would be my first experience on a plane, and so my first experience overseas as well. My friend and I were casually walking the streets of Rome, not too far away from our hotel actually. We were taking pictures and whatnot, wasting time before we met our entire group of around 15 kids and 4 teachers. We were going to meet up for pizza at a small restaurant close by. This comes into play with what happened later at the restaurant. Fast forward and we arrived there with everyone in tow, all sitting on the sidewalk eating pizza and chatting away happily. The teachers were sitting inside the restaurant right next to the door, 
to keep an eye on what was happening outside. I decided to quickly go next door to buy myself a bottle of water. I didn't think to take anyone with me, as the tiny corner store was so close by that a few kids were even sitting nearby the entrance. After purchasing my water and leaving the store, suddenly I was pushed up against a light post by a large man in a dark jacket who'd come out of nowhere. He towered over me and opened his jacket to cover my body. He asked me my name. I was in such shock that I couldn't even respond, so he asked me again. I refused to tell him. Luckily, one of the girls saw what was happening. She ran over and grabbed me out of the man's reach. I immediately burst out crying, which alerted the teachers as well. Our headmaster, thinking he may have just been a drunk or something, shouted at him to leave or else. The man rushed around the corner and disappeared. All was well, and things calmed down a bit. I was now standing against the wall with six people in front of me, closer to the entrance. I watched, though, as the same man popped out of what seemed like nowhere once again. He tried to break through the people in front of me and grab me out of plain sight. This obviously caused a huge havoc with everyone around us. All the adults went on high alert and started getting involved, they began to chase the man away. He ran a little further down the road this time, hopped into a white car, and drove off as quickly as he had come. We got the entire group together again and were escorted back to the hotel. We were all very confused by this situation. Later that evening, we got our free time where we got to pick our own restaurant in the area to go to with our group of friends. We had to be in groups of five. We dressed up, walked down the streets until we found a restaurant we seemed to like. The earlier incident had lost all its worry, with all the excitement and activities going on since then. We were very distracted. We then all, the whole group minus adults, decided to meet up at a bar. Since of course Euro tours can't be complete without the older group trying to act a little bit naughty, slipping in a few irresponsible drinks before curfew. As we got to the entrance, I was pulled inside by two of the people on my tour and told to sit down right away. Apparently, someone had spotted the exact same man that had tried to abduct me earlier in the very same white car, sitting parked a little further down a dark road. This time, he was with another man as well. I broke down. We were all terrified. We explained what was going on to the owners as best we could and decided to head back to the hotel as a group constantly checking around us and keeping count of every person. Luckily, we were leaving for a different town not many hours away very early the next morning. That experience still haunts me. I don't know where the man first saw me or what his intentions were exactly. He may have been following me the whole day, even through the night, knowing exactly what hotel I was staying in and everything. Being from South Africa myself, Europe was basically another world to me, and we had this idea that everything was safe and free compared to our own country. Now looking back though, I wish I didn't let my guard down so far. On another note though, Italy was very incredible, and the pizza and pasta and other foods were the bomb.